Science and diplomacy. Well, I, I'll talk about science first because <clears throat> I'm fundamentally a scientist and I've always loved science, although I do love English and philosophy. So I, I see myself as something of an intellectual. I don't mean to sound pompous in saying that. I mean, I like to think about things. I like it's a good day when I've learned something new. I like to, have, especially if it's a minor epiphany, something I really didn't realize or understand. Always been curious. So in science, I um, graduated into genetics and biochemistry. And to cut the long story now short, uh, my two interests are understanding the information content of the human genome. And I was particularly um, taken by the uh, premature uh, assumption that most of the genome was junk, simply because it didn't fit the conventional view of what genes were or did. And I spent most of my career pursuing that alternative, and it turns out I think that I'm correct and the evidence now shows that, that most of the human genome is uh, coding for RNAs uh, that control our development, to put it simply. En route, I also uh, became very interested in genomics because I, I see biology, by the way, and science more in informational terms than I do in chemical terms. And so I thought that knowing about human genome, not just in terms of how it works, but what's the difference between you and me, or us and other species, was going to be very important uh, in understanding life and health, etc. So I've always been interested in genomics uh, in the sense of diversity and understanding, you know, why a lime's different from a lemon, for example, and how we could use that to improve agriculture or healthcare. So they're my twin things: genomics in healthcare, basically, and understanding this beautiful software suite called the human genome. Now, do you know? that the human genome has about the same information content as a full version of Microsoft Word, in formal informational terms. And yet it creates something that walks and talks. Unbelievable. And we still don't understand it properly. So I think it's, make, you know, it's a wonderful thing to study and to, but you know, there's just simple things like that. I think, wow, right. You know, and we all start off as a single cell and here we are talking. Yeah, so that's me. <clears throat> That is uh, uh, the background that has uh, led to our uh, interest in your oh, first. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I didn't talk about science diplomacy. <laughs> well, but but, but uh, talking about science diplomacy, then, um, how do you understand that concept? And is that an understanding that has changed over time? I don't understand the concept terribly well at all. I, I, intuitively, I, I think I know what it means. Um, but, uh, and, you know, to the extent that science has always been an international endeavor, and it's been very little troubled by politics. I think scientists across the globe, you know, communicate and enjoy each other's company and are really not too concerned. They might be in other contexts, but not in the knowledge exchange, you know, so that's a wonderful thing about it. Um, different economies have different capacities uh, for science and translation, and that really comes down to the strength of their economy. So when I think about, um, egalitarianism, and, and, and that's a fundamental article of faith where I come from, because we all arrived, at, well, the early ones as convicts, and you know, so we, we value egalite very much. Uh, is the, the, the developing countries need to focus on, um, I think, good governance, getting rid of, I don't want to get too political, getting rid of corruption. When you've got good governance, then prosperity follows. And with prosperity comes better education and better healthcare, and better ability to, to use and develop science for your own economies. So I'd be interested in your definition of sci uh, science diplomacy and whether I could comment any further, but I've always enjoyed the international aspect of it. And I think uh, always been very, um, not just willing, but very enthusiastic about um, helping wherever I can, you know, whether it's giving advice at some time time in Southeast Asia or Etc. So, do you think that uh, innovation and uh, uh, international scientific collaboration can be used as a tool to foster diplomatic relations, uh, for example, between um, the Latin America and the UK, but also between countries in general? And is that something you have seen in practice in your career? Science is a great, a great way of building bridges. That's for sure, and. Uh, I remember recently in Canberra, you know, the Australian Academy of Science, uh, an Indonesian delegation came through, one of whom is a dear friend of mine. Uh, and the warmth is palpable, I think, people around it. And 
it actually is a very strong bridge between the countries because we have such good and deep connections. You know, in a way, everything, you can say things about culture, that's true, but relationships are really important and science builds relationships and trust. So I think that from that point of view, yes. Um, how it might, um, uh, well, I I any way that you can improve relationships, particularly at high levels and technical levels, is a good thing. Uh, and maybe it mitigates some of the um, chesting that goes on around, uh, you know, territorial matters or, or ideologies. Do you think that there are particular social challenges that would benefit from uh, being addressed in this way? What you want to do is exchange experience and and uh, help each other do things. You know, I can see that many of the systems the NHS or Britain might have developed might be useful to adopt in some way in the context of South America. But some things in South America might be actually uh, interesting to think about in the NHS, which are one might say has got a little bit stodgy um, and, and fresh ideas from emerging uh, groups are always interesting to consider. So cross-fertilisation is terrific. And, you know, I know we were talking earlier about uh, immigration policies and things. You, you, one should look at what other countries or, or, or communities do that seems to work or, and then uh, take the best of that and try and introduce it. You don't want to invent everything yourself. So. Yes, that's the short answer, yeah. Do you, um, in your personal um, professional experience, feel that uh, you have learned from uh, colleagues from other countries on uh, what they do? I first learned this, well actually when I left home from Sydney to go to Melbourne to do my PhD, but then I went from Melbourne to the United States to do my postdoc. And I really push my students to do that, whether they go to Europe or North America or anywhere else for that matter. Japan is more common these days than it used to be. Um, you, you get such a great experience, not just scientifically, just socially. I don't think you can understand your home until you've left it and you can look back on it because some things are universal and some things are not. And you really don't know the difference between those two things till you sit in Texas or, you know, where it might be. So I think it's a really enriching experience and that um, not just traveling in a tourism sense, uh, but living in other places, you get a great sense of um, the, the depth and, and beauty of the human spirit. You get much more sympathy for different cultures. You know, even with the United States, with the, the gun problems they have, you know, you understand why they think that way. You don't agree with it, but you've got a better understanding, you know, because they value that, you know, it goes back to their constitution. So I think it's everybody, whether they're in government or, but, or science, should preferably live somewhere else for a while, many places. Uh, it's so enriching. And then, of course, you've got the cross-fertilisation, you know, that in, in science and another social, cultural level, the way things were done in the United States in research were subtly but significantly different from the way that I'd been used to where I'd grown up in Australia. Uh, and they're different here in the United Kingdom as well. So you learn from that because then you actually got two sets of things you can, the ways of approaching and do things. So, and then of course you've got the point to point exchange of information with peers. And I, I, I don't know if it's half, but certainly a, a lot of my publications have been international collaborations and I love them. And I love them because, you know, you know how to do something I don't. So it means I don't, so we work together and we get moved twice as fast. And also we have a lot of fun because we're achieving things. We like each other's company. So it's, uh, it's glorious, you know. And thinking about that kind of process a lot, fostering uh, diplomatic relations through scientific collaboration, uh, how do you think a summit uh, like Shaping Horizons can play a role in that? Well, I think um, uh, it plays a strong role. Uh, I, I think what we need to do in diplomacy, uh, and what we're really talking about is relations between countries and communities and, and, and making those as productive and friendly as possible is to get the people who are making policy and representing nation A or B to understand science and technology much better than they do. Now some countries have science attaches and sections in their embassies and consulates, but not all do. I think a serious weakness in international affairs is the ignorance, and I mean that kindly, 
uh, of most of our diplomats and uh, in, in, in science and technology. Because most of those people have come from law and related backgrounds. And unfortunately, in many jurisdictions, including the United Kingdom, science and the arts are separated early in education. So I, I would like to see more people with science backgrounds go into foreign affairs generally, be able to talk at that level, because science and technology drive the world. All of history is built on science and technology when you strip it back from the personalities. It's critical to national prosperity, it's critical to everything. So we need more literacy in science and technology in our diplomatic corps, for sure. I think we need more literacy in the community, and I would very strongly argue that all education systems should be giving all students the same education, depending on their ability, but up to year 12. So they know about government, they know about our history, they know about world history, they know about biology, they know what DNA is, they know how business works, etc. Because that then gives them a platform for life and then specialist training after that. So I, I, I don't mean to sound too critical, but I think it, the lack of science literacy and, and empathy in the diplomatic corps is really a, a disadvantage. Uh, and not fully plugged by having a science come, a scientist come along to your meetings. But that, that's, that's a good thing to do. So the deeper thing, and I, I don't want to be too repetitive, but is the understanding that science and technology is not some sort of thing like the opera, you know, nice to have, but, you know, it is fundamental to not only the economy and prosperity, but to the human condition. Everything about, every aspect of your life and mine is built on knowledge and the application of that knowledge. So every society should be embracing that as best they can and figuring that into their discourse. You have had the opportunity to speak to some of the young and potentially future leaders uh, here uh, mm. in the summit. And if you would give one final piece of advice to them, what would that be? I've noticed that the, the summits like this tend to attract people who are socially active, social activists, and that's a good thing. But the, the, many people in that area, and you can edit this as whichever way you like, uh, uh, tend to be looking for reasons not to do something. Or what about insurance? What about this? What about the disadvantage? Is that inequitable? Well, yes, they're all issues and problems that have to be addressed. But I'm somebody, I would say to the young people, look for productive change, new things that are going to bring better lives. At the same time, consider what the rough edges might be or the problems and challenges and then try to reduce those as best you can. Very hard to anticipate all of the future, but you know, you've got a new technology like genomics or anything, you know, it, it's got such a power for good, you know. So say that first, think about that first, how to, to use science and technology to improve your life and the lives of your communities, you know, that's your responsibility. But also, to make sure that they do improve, think about the ways to, to mitigate uh, any problems that might arise, because there's always you know, rough bits. So that's my advice. Be positive, look for positive change, and then how to make that as productive uh, as possible. Thank you so much.